Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. We are all hoping to see the Starship launch on its transorbital test flight, and then continue to watch as it is refined over time and made safe for human spaceflight. But while we have advocated launching Starship into orbit without crew, sending humans up later by Dragon Capsule, for space worthiness testing, we run into a big problem if Starship plans to launch into space with people. Starship does not currently have an in-flight abort option. It has been suggested that the Raptors could be started up fast enough to get Starship safely away from a failing Super Heavy booster. We find that solution to be improbable, but today the Terran Space Academy will present a solution for your consideration. First, let's look back at why we need an abort solution at all. In the early days of spaceflight, rockets were much less dependable than they are today. In fact, when Alan Shepard became the first American in space, about one in three American rockets still failed during launch. And it was thought that an escape system should be installed on any rocket approved for human flight. These are usually called abort or escape systems and sometimes are referred to as escape abort. Ejection systems were used on aircraft as early as 1910 with elastic bands and 1916 with compressed air. The first true ejection seat was designed and successfully tested in the late 1920s by Anastase Dragomir. When it came to spacecraft, it was usually assumed that we should eject the entire capsule. However, the Soviet Vostok and the American Gemini capsules both had ejection seats installed as did the American Space Shuttle during initial flight testing. But these were only for the pilot and co-pilot and were disabled before operational flights. Rocket escape systems almost always use solid rocket motors. These very simple rockets are not as efficient, but are very dependable. For many capsules, these are attached to the nose of the spacecraft. Seen here on the Mercury, Soyuz, Apollo, and Orion capsules. Here we can see one firing. And here we see an escape abort test using one of these. Engines can also be on the capsule itself, like the hypergolic Super Draco engines on the SpaceX Dragon capsule. Here we can see these engines firing during an in-flight abort test. To begin our study of these systems, let's start with the earliest human-rated American rocket. Here we see a Mercury Redstone rocket, MR-1. The Mercury Redstone was a single-stage booster designed to launch the first American into suborbital space. There were over 800 modifications made to the original Redstone missile to get it ready for human flight with the Mercury capsule. Mercury was America's first crewed spacecraft and carried one astronaut. After all these modifications, the rocket was named Mercury Redstone, or MR. MR-1 was launched on November 21, 1960. Kind of. It rose about four inches off the ground, then shut down, settling back on the launch pad. It sat there for a moment, fully fueled and ready to explode. Then, in a sad display of early computer rebellion, the escape abort rocket fired, leaving the capsule attached to the rocket and launching itself to a safe landing about 400 yards away. We can all understand how it felt, but that's no excuse for cowardice. In fact, because this was an unmanned flight, the abort system was supposed to be disabled. So while the engineers were trying to figure out how that happened, the capsule deployed its drogue parachute. This is a small parachute that helps deploy the much larger main parachute. Not to be outdone, the main parachute then deployed. And, seemingly in a fit of disgust at being abandoned by the escape rocket, the capsule angrily ejected its radio antenna. Now the engineers were really confused. The rocket was sitting on the pad still fully fueled and obviously insane. They couldn't remove the propellants as the ground support equipment had disconnected before it tried to launch. They decided they could not approach the rocket as it was fully fueled. This proved to be a wise decision, unknown to the Americans. The Soviets had proven just a month before on 24 October 1960 at the Baikonur test range, that approaching a fully-fueled rocket was a bad idea. 
On that date, a prototype R-16 rocket was being tested. The rocket was fueled with hypergolic UDMH and NTO, with a little nitric acid thrown in to keep everyone on their toes. The electronics of the second stage was being tested, while about 300 people worked nearby. A short circuit ignited the second stage engines. Everyone started running away, but the area was surrounded by a perimeter fence, which trapped them too close to the rocket. The second stage engine ignited the first stage propellant tanks, and the resulting explosion killed about half of the 300 workers, including 70 officers and engineers and a top aide to Khrushchev. This was called the Nedeline Catastrophe in honor of Mitrofan Nedeline, the director of the project and commander-in-chief of the Soviet Strategic Missile Force. The Americans took a different approach. They kept everyone away from the rocket and just let the liquid oxygen boil away. They then sent some brave soul to offload the ethyl alcohol fuel. This was supposed to have been the first test flight of this rocket and was four months before Alan Shepard was scheduled to ride one of these into space. Mercury Redstone 1A and Mercury Redstone 2 launched successfully, but both experienced over-acceleration in flight, and for different reasons. A faulty accelerometer for Flight 1A and a bad liquid oxygen regulator for Flight 2. This over-acceleration could potentially cause structural failure or harm an astronaut. The second flight, MR2, had a chimpanzee named Ham on board. And when he was subjected to excessive G-forces, the Abort Sensing and Implementation System, or ACES, detected this and fired the abort motor, subjecting poor Ham to even higher G-forces. But he landed safely. Chimpanzees are tremendously stronger than humans. The third flight was named MRBD. They say it stood for Booster Development, but I think it stood for a bit dicey. It was an engineering test flight to make sure the problems with flights 1, 1A, and 2 had been rectified. This flight did not produce excessive G-forces, but, like the first two flights had also, exhibited high vibration levels. So 340 pounds of lead-infused plastic was added to the interstage, as well as additional bracing and stiffeners. Without evaluating these changes, the rocket was then labeled human-rated, and Flight MR3 carried Alan Shepard into space. Ah, the good old days. By the way, Vibration was still severe on his flight, and the last Mercury Redstone flight, MR-4 with Gus Grissom, packed in even more mass and bracing. Grissom landed safely, but when they added an atlas to get a satellite to orbit, flexing and vibration at the interstage destroyed the rocket. Since these lessons, no American rocket has ever used its abort system in an emergency. The Soviets, however, have. After a decade of successful flights, the Soviets had two aborts with their Soyuz capsules. One in 1975 with Soyuz 18-1, but this was after the escape tower had been jettisoned and used the engines on the Soyuz capsule itself to carry the crew to safety. The second was in 1983 with the T-10-1 flight when a launch vehicle caught fire on the pad and exploded. This was also a successful abort with the crew landing safely. On October 11 of 2018, a malfunctioning sensor caused an in-flight abort 119 seconds after launch, just as the second stage was separating from the third stage. The cosmonaut and astronaut on board both landed safely. No American rocket has had to fire its abort engines in an emergency. But we must consider that for 30 years, while Russia was still flying Soyuz, Americans were flying the space shuttle. The space shuttle did not have a separate abort system. The space shuttle was, as we all know, attached to the side of a massive hydrogen external tank, with two solid rocket boosters attached to that tank. The space shuttle was, however, supposed to have abort modes. You can see these displayed here. Before the boosters separate, there is really not an abort mode. At one time, it was planned to have a cockpit ejection system, like we saw on the B-1 Lancer. This would have provided an option during this section of the flight. In fact, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded during this phase of the flight, when a rubber O-ring was too cold and cracked, allowing hot exhaust gas from the booster to impact the side of the hydrogen tank. It turns out that despite this massive explosion, 
the cockpit section, and the crew survived. Had the B-1 design been followed, it's possible they might have lived. As it was, the crew was killed on impact with the water. After booster separation, it would have been possible to turn back around, shut off the main engines, eject the external tank, and glide back to the launch site. This is a return to launch site aboard. If we had to cross the Atlantic and land on the other side, it was called a transoceanic abort landing, or TAL, not shown in this diagram. If our ship survives past main engine cutoff or MECO, but we don't have enough velocity for a stable orbit, we can separate the hydrogen external tank and use the rockets on the orbital maneuvering system, or OMS, to fly back to a safe landing after going around the Earth once. This is the abort once around option. If we have to abort after MECO and do have enough velocity to reach a stable orbit, we can perform an abort to orbit. This would be a low stable orbit about 190 kilometers above the Earth. This occurred during mission STS-51F, when Challenger's center engine failed 5 minutes and 46 seconds into flight. Despite the lower orbit, Challenger was able to complete its mission. It turned out that a faulty temperature sensor had caused the engine shutdown. Now let's look at options for Starship. The Starship is a very large two-stage steel spacecraft. It launches on top the Super Heavy booster. This booster will have about 3,400 tons of propellant at launch. If this booster were to catch fire or explode on the launch pad, like the Soyuz T-10-1 flight, what could we do? The Starship is much larger than the Space Shuttle, as you see here. And like the Shuttle, it does not have a launch escape tower. And if one were constructed, it would have to be ridiculously large and impractical. An escape module like the B-1 bomber had would not work well. The Starship would have a much larger crew and passengers. Like the shuttle, the Starship will only have engines at the rear of the ship. But unlike the shuttle, these will not be firing in flight. For the lunar Starship, it might be possible to make a detachable nose cone that would use the upper engine seen here to lift the top part of the spaceship to safety. It might still need a parachute, as the engines burning fuel from the header tanks, could help perform a propulsive landing. Perhaps with airbags, like those on the B-1 Lancer escape pod, seen in this lesson. But making a detachable section adds a lot of mass. This might be okay for a custom-built lunar starship. You could make most of this thing out of carbon fiber and aluminum if you wanted to. It's not coming back to re-enter the atmosphere and land on Earth. But what about regular starships? the Soviets were able to do something we call hot staging. Do you see these open areas on the Soviet N-1 moon rocket? These don't seem very aerodynamic, and they aren't. But since this rocket was not reusable, they would spin up the upper engines before blowing the explosive bolts holding the two stages together. Just before the lower stage completely burns out. This gap is here to allow the hot gases to escape. If it were enclosed, we would have a bomb. Now let's talk for a moment about the difference between combustion, conflagration, pressure waves, detonations, and shock waves. Combustion we are all familiar with, some of us more than others. Combustion is the process of combining a fuel with an oxidizer and igniting them. This is what we generally call burning. Combustion is from the Latin word combustionum, which combines the root com, or with, to bustio, which means burning. Scientists like to use words in Latin and Greek because they have more gravitas and make us sound smart. And because the earliest surviving texts the Western world had during the Dark Ages, from natural philosophers, mathematicians, and experimentalists, were mainly from these cultures. Except algebra. That's Arabic. Understanding combustion is very important for an understanding of rocket science. So combustion is a chemical reaction that combines fuel with oxidizer resulting in burning. By the way, the oxidizer does not have to always be oxygen. You can use toxic elements like fluorine and chlorine also. Some rocket engineers have. And an amazing book on this process is called Ignition by John D. Clark, who seems to share our belief that learning should be fun.
Combustion is exothermic, meaning it releases energy in the form of heat. Heat is the increased kinetic energy of subatomic particles, in this case the gas molecules. As heat increases, pressure increases, and this causes the gas to start expanding. You can see this here. This is a conflagration. And to a degree, so is this. At the border of this expanding gas zone, you have a transition zone, where the expanding gas molecules are impacting the less energetic and therefore slower moving air molecules. This creates a pressure wave. If this pressure wave stays subsonic, we call it a conflagration, a rapidly expanding area of combustion. This can be called an explosion, which is a rapid release of energy. And this is also sometimes called deflagration, which is oxidation by the rapid combustion of a substance. And this is one of the reasons I'm glad I grew up speaking English, because it must be one of the most confusing languages on Earth. Combustion produced conflagration or deflagration does of course produce a sound. And here is a conflagration. This is a SpaceX Falcon 9 that suffered an anomaly while fueling. It turns out that there was a small defect in a carbon overwrapped titanium pressure tank that was being filled with high pressure helium. SpaceX is unique in that it puts its high pressure helium tanks inside the oxygen tanks. This reduces high pressure lines and saves mass and also helps insulate the tanks. But this tank had a small defect or dent in its surface. When the high pressure helium caused the dent to suddenly pop out, it compressed the carbon overwrap with the oxygen in the tank. This worked like an igniter, which, in the high oxygen environment, caused combustion of the carbon overwrap. Combustion, or the expansion of hot gas from combustion in an enclosed container, does cause an explosion. Explosions, of course, make a loud sound, as all sound is just pressure waves in the air or other medium. And again, while this may be considered an explosion, this is not a detonation, as long as the pressure wave stays subsonic. French scientists in the 1800s discovered that if the pressure wave becomes supersonic, it is much more powerful, and we call that a detonation. Detonation is also considered the result of supersonic waves creating a secondary explosion, like when a detonator uses high explosives, like RDX, to set off a less sensitive explosive like TNT. Interestingly, nuclear weapons are not very effective in space because most of the damage from nuclear weapons is from the detonation creating an advancing supersonic shock wave in the air. Without an atmosphere in space, these weapons are much weaker, which is why Bruce Willis had to bury one deep in that asteroid. Putting combustion in a closed container is a fast way to get hurt. With no way to escape, the pressure can exceed the limits of the container, and you get an explosion. Something as simple as an almost empty hairspray can in a campfire can kill someone. Putting combustion in a closed container with one opening is called a rocket engine. Rocket engines do create a supersonic expansion of gas. Remember that gas particles are subsonic in the combustion chamber, reach the speed of sound for those gas conditions in the throat, and become supersonic when expanding into the nozzle, or off the aerospike nozzle in my preferred engine. Shout out to the engineering geniuses at Pangea Aerospace. Make something fly, gentlemen. Make it fly. But detonations can create faster gas pressure waves than the rocket engine's converging diverging nozzle can. And faster gas particles would mean a higher exhaust velocity, giving us a more efficient rocket and higher delta V. The problem is that rocket scientists usually go to great lengths to avoid detonations, because these sudden shocks can destroy our engines. If ignition doesn't occur just as the fuel and oxidizer build up in the combustion chamber, we can get a detonation called a hard start. If the pressure buildup exceeds the strength of the combustion chamber, the rocket engine either automatically shuts down or blows up. Some rocket scientists are trying to tame detonations by creating either a rotating detonation that is continuous or a pulse detonation. These are called detonation rocket engines. NASA has been working on a pulse detonation engine, and in fact, the United States Air Force took one of my favorite airplanes, a long EZ by scaled composites, and tested a pulse detonation engine designed back in 2008. This engine was basically a series of long tubes with small detonations at one end. There are also rotating detonation rocket engines. The US Air Force has done a lot of work on these, and a detonation should be able to get a plane above Mach 4. 
Other countries are working on these too. Here is one from India. To keep from destroying the engine, the detonation power must be kept very low. That might be efficient for horizontal flight at some point, but wouldn't work well for rockets. I would be negligent at this point, not to mention the Orion concept. Freeman Dyson was a brilliant man who suggested using very small nuclear explosions to propel a very large spaceship, up to 10% the speed of light. We have an entire lesson on this concept coming up, so we'll limit today to non-nuclear detonation rockets. I'll put some links on these types in the description. No large rocket engine flying today uses detonation propulsion, and an unplanned detonation can still blow an engine apart. It takes a tremendous amount of continuous thrust to get a large rocket off the ground. The space shuttle main engines ignite on takeoff and help get the space shuttle to orbit. Without them helping the solid rocket boosters, the ship couldn't fly. This meant that if the space shuttle had to abort during flight, its engines were already firing. This was one advantage of the side-mounted option. Starship cannot ignite its engines while attached to the booster, or we will have a second stage firing while still attached to the first stage. Something that the Nedeline catastrophe has convinced us is a bad option. At this point, it has been suggested that, in case of an emergency, the Starship will release the holding clamps to the booster, spin up its engines, and fire them. There is some doubt this can be done fast enough to get the Starship to safety. Here is what we propose. The Super Heavy booster looks like this. Here is the oxygen tank on the bottom because fully fueled it has the greatest mass. And here is the methane tank. The Starship will be mated to the booster. SpaceX will not be using explosive bolts for separation. As they want these ships to be rapidly reusable, they will instead have a seating and clamping mechanism. In case of an emergency, these clamps could be rapidly released. But how could we propel the Starship away from the booster, giving it enough time to spin up its engines? Simple. Both the methane and oxygen tanks will be pressurized to 7 or 8 bar prior to launch. We suggest that under every vacuum raptor nozzle attached to the top of the methane tank, there should be a large pipe structure. This pipe would have feed lines running from the oxygen pressurization lines, and it would also have igniters. In case of an emergency, the Starship would order that these large one-way valves open releasing a flood of hot methane gas into the vacuum raptor nozzles. These valves would also open to allow more oxygen into this flow and igniters would fire, creating what the military calls gas generators. Gas generators are used to rapidly move the doors, protecting an intercontinental ballistic missile, like the Minuteman or Peacekeeper, so the missiles can clear debris and launch. These gas generators are essentially just one metal tube inside another, with chemicals inside to explosively generate the gas. As the tubes move apart, they pull on cables connected to the blast door, throwing this 110-ton structure a significant distance. We would essentially be constructing massive hot gas thrusters on top the Super Heavy booster that would generate expanding hot gas between these ports and these vacuum nozzles, the force of which would be contained in the vacuum nozzles lifting the Starship up and away from the Super Heavy booster, as these three engines are spinning up to full power. Once these Center 3 Raptors fire, they can fly the Starship up and away from the explosion. The Starship can then be flown to a pre-designated emergency abort site, where it will hover at a safe distance, burning propellant and oxidizer, until it is safe to land. This system would work at any phase of Starship operation, even on the launch pad. We think this might be the most viable Starship aboard option. Let us know what you think in the comments. And please remember to like and subscribe, and stay safe. At Astro Proterra.